everyone. Welcome back to The Psychedelic Entrepreneur. I'm really excited to present to you Eamon Armstrong. <laughs> That's Eamon Armstrong. Hi, Eamon. Thank you so much for being with us. Hey, Beth. Nice to be here. So if you don't know Eamon, he is the creator of Life is a Festival, a podcast promoting adventure and personal development through the lens of global festival culture and the Psychedelic Therapy Podcast, an interview series specifically for psychedelic therapists. Formerly a professional festival reviewer, Eamon is an enthusiast of personal growth and psychedelic healing. He is an initiate with the Bwiti tradition in Gabon and a psychedelic peer support sitter with MAPS Zendo Project. Eamon is also a passionate advocate for men's work and offers public talks and workshops from mythopoetic men's work to stand up comedy on integrating masculinity. So, hey, Eamon, I have known about you and your Life is a Festival podcast and your work for I can't even count how many years. And I've always been really fascinated by someone who made their career out of festivals and now festivals and also psychedelics and, and masculinity and men's work. But can you tell us your story? How the hell did you become uh, a professional festival goer? <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, I love the premise and discussing entrepreneurship in the context of what we do and love because we're all trying to make our way in this world. And um, if you get a chance to do something that you love and not burn out on the thing you love, you know, like in balance, um, I think that's one of the biggest wins one can have in this life. And I'm very grateful because uh, my life has, has definitely flowed in a direction of self-expression being a primary source of, of, of my livelihood. So, um, how on earth did I get to be a professional <laughs> festival reviewer? So I think that I'm more of a, 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 a specialist in kind of community and um, healing and community with a focus on festival culture and similar uh, transformational incubators. So I'm also into like, I like intentional communities. I like ceremonies. I like psychedelic retreats, um, but festivals have really been what I've been known for. Um, because of my work with Fest 300, which uh, was, no longer is, um, an online guide to 300 festivals around the world and a festival magazine that was founded by Chip Conley and Art Gimbel in 2013. So how did I get to do that? Well, boys and girls, you must follow your dreams um, and allow your dreams to change. So I was a musician in my 20s and um, I threw mushroom tea parties on Haight Street with a, with a group called I Can Dress Myself. And um, we're very much into community and using these newfangled social media tools. Um, they were newfangled at that time. This was like 2008 um, to build community and to get people to both come to our shows, but also participate in our parties and kind of ultimately created this sort of um, menagerie of, of psychedelic adventurers. Um, and I think a lot of people have done that with friends groups where they've kind of built friend groups into these sort of like more professional operations and event production and that sort of thing. So that's what I was doing in my twenties. And, um, I went to burning man. My friend was like, Hey, we got to take this thing to burning man. And I didn't know what burning man was, but apparently it's where you went if you were doing avant-garde psychedelic projects or, or, <laughs> or electronic music. So we went there and did our, our song and dance. We built a, a camp the first year we went. Um, and, uh, your question is how did I get to do the cool stuff that I do? And I want to share how I did it in a way that is actionable for people listening, which is, um, I highly recommend volunteering for things. I think volunteering for things is an excellent way of, of getting from being on the outside of something to being invited in. So I started volunteering for the Burning Man special events team. Um, and the Burning Man special events team managed all of Burning Man's off playa events. So that's like decompression street fair. They did a, a, a pre-compression, Bernal Equinox. And so I got this hands-on experience doing event production in the Burning Man ecosystem. Um, and I also brought to the table my facility with social media tools. Um, at that time, it was not as common. So these event producers who knew, who were kind of in the Burning Man orbit were watching me use these tools successfully. And then I started getting invited 
to um, work on different projects. Um, and I wasn't making very much money, but I was working really hard. And I, what I ended up doing is I ended up serving a single community through different clients, which were sort of like the Bay Area, Burning Man style event producers. So like Sunset, um, Opal, um, uh, Opal? Is it called Opal? I don't know. I don't remember what they're called. Actually, let's edit out what they're called because I should remember who I've worked for. Yikes. Um, I'm not, I, <laughs> let's just say I worked, I don't know if I get to edit out my Tom Fleury, but um, I worked for a couple of different event producers doing street fairs and annual events. And I was promoting to sort of the, the kind of like Burning Man psychedelic community writ large. So I was hiring photographers out of this community to shoot these events and, and kind of like bringing, like just cultivating an ecosystem. Um, and then in 2013, Art Gimbel and Chip Conley created a, uh, a guide to the world's best festivals. And they were looking for someone who specialized in building community around events. And because I was very publicly doing this, my name came up a couple of times and they invited me to apply. Um, and I'd always been like a musician who waited tables. Like I hadn't had like, like a job job in this way, but I put everything I had into the interview. I worked really hard to like prepare to present myself. And, and ultimately Chip, who's a magical person, Chip Conley, he ended up you know taking Airbnb Global on the board of Burning Man, a really important mentor of mine. It was his birthday this weekend. Um, he said, okay, we love you, but you, we don't think that you have enough experience for this. So we're going to hire you and we're going to hire a consultant to train you. <laughs> so I got hired. They took a chance on me. I worked as hard as I possibly could. And then over the course of four years with Fest 300, I worked my way from being the community manager to ultimately being the creative director and the face of the company. And by that time, I was flying around the world, going to the best parties, um, writing about them, hiring people. And then the global festival community was the ecosystem that I was serving and cultivating. And my the process by which I did that was just being just like unconditionally friendly and of service to everyone as a representative of Fest 300. Um, and it was amazing because I when, when Chip ultimately sold the website, um, I walked away with this extraordinary community a great reputation and the ability to kind of launch other projects, i.e. podcasts down the road. Um, so that's kind of, that's the flow of how I got to where I am now. And then after Fest 300 concluded, I did some personal exploration stuff. I was maybe going to write a book. I was kind of trying to see how I could continue to serve, uh, <clears throat> continue to serve transformational culture. And I landed on this podcast, Life is a Festival, which is now grown to the point that um, I'm working with a team to pitch the Life is a Festival TV show, an adaptation of the podcast. Um, and I'm in that process now and also working with psychedelic medicine separately. So therein lies Amazing. my career journey. Amazing. No, this is like, I'm like, this sounds like a dream career, a dream job, getting paid to go attend festivals. Um, and I, I really think it's important what you said, even though it was kind of in jest a little bit. But yes, it is about following this passion, right? Like it sounds like you accidentally landed in this and then now you're, you work with two, your own podcast, work with Maya Health on their psychedelic therapy podcast, um, pitching, a, pitching a TV show. This is amazing. So let's talk about how um, festival culture and, you know, the psychedelic culture that you were, you know, doing mushroom parties on hate, which by the way, almost sounds cliche, but awesome. I grew up going to hate when I was a kid and getting offered acid on the streets back then. Um, and that's kind of how I ended up doing it at the age of 14. <laughs> but, but let's talk about this. Um, your experience working with psychedelics, probably I'm assuming at, at a younger age or at least in the festival culture. And then now also having experience in something as really deep and intense as going to Gabon to work with Iboga. Um, how do these two connect? I'm wondering, you know, what was your experience working with psychedelics in kind of this recreational um, community and transformational festivals, which, by the way, are very deep experiences, but people think of them as like party experiences. And then now you're hosting something like the Psychedelic Therapist podcast. Um, how, do, how, does, how does this bridge 
uh, come about in your life? And what would you say about this interconnection between like the recreational and then the healing? Yeah, medicinal? well, I would. Um, so it's the psychedelic therapy podcast. Um, and therapy. Uh, no worries. Um, and the direct bridge was Zendo, um, MAPS's uh, psychedelic peer support, Zendo. That was the real bridge. For me personally, um, I've had challenges with um, my mental health throughout my life and um, my relationship to healing, both my mental health and also my relationship to sexuality and gender has been a huge motivating force for me. Um, and because I was part of the troubled teen industry, I got sent away when I was a kid. And so I was sort of like this experience of doing like workshops and like the constant sort of cycle of healing was sort of like imprinted on me at a young age. So that's always been part of who I am. And I think ultimately like a good part of who I am. I think it's ultimately a benefit, but it's, you know, like everything, it has its light and it's dark. Um, so I've, I've, when I first went to Burning Man, it was a healing experience for me, particularly around gender. Um, I remember seeing, so I'm like, a, um, I'm a, my gender is kind of a, my gender sexuality is kind of a constellation. Like I move into different expressions at different times. And I, I broadly consider myself queer. There's a bit of some trans energy in there. It's just, you know, it's, uh, I used to think it was a mess. Now I think it's just a beautiful kaleidoscope. Um, but that journey of self-acceptance really, was um, galvanized through Burning Man and through seeing people in the level of self-expression and freedom and liberation that I saw there. So my first experience at Burning Man was so transformational that I immediately saw Burning Man and any sort of participatory festival environment um, to varying degrees to be a container for transformational growth. And in believing in that and actually having like a passion for that, I've really promoted it. And I really, when I was, you know, leading content for Fest 300, I was pushing a lot of like the content of community and transformational growth being festivals. Um, now, of course, that involved like doing a lot of acid in the desert. And um, I I had a big breakup that kind of brought me into ayahuasca work where, where I, had a, I had a painful breakup. And right around that time, someone's like, do you want to do an ayahuasca ceremony? And I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And so that, that, you know, plant medicine became part of my personal journey. But how it, the, the transition professionally was really around Zendo. Um, so I'm going to take a breather because I'm talking too fast. <laughs> so, um, so the Zendo project is MAPS's nonprofit psychedelic peer support service. And what they do is they create safe spaces at festivals similar environments, but primarily festivals and burns, where someone who's having a difficult psychedelic experience can come and sit with someone who can provide um, a, a sort of, you know, unconditional presence, friendliness and care to allow that individual to have a, a good resolution of the difficult psychological experiencing they're having that's been triggered through the psychedelic. Um, I volunteered with them as a journalist in 2015 at a festival called Envision in Costa Rica. And it was funny because I had done ayahuasca and in my ayahuasca ceremony, I had this like invitation to get involved in psychedelic peer support. It was like a very clear sort of like, you know, we, we do these medicines and we get these downloads. And, and so downloads like I should go do this. So I pitched to Chip to fly me to Costa Rica to camp with the Zendo learn all about it and write an article. And I promised him, I was like, I will write you a viral article. I promise it will be viral. If you, like viral within the community, um, if you do this. And he's like, okay, you know, he, he's a wonderful man who would often give me a chance at things. And I kind of built a coalition of, um, of drug reform advocates and people in festival culture who are pushing harm reduction. And I got a lot of their support around this article. I wrote 7,000 words about psychedelic peer support, how it works, the history of it, how you do it. And it was based on my experience sitting with, with the Zendo project. Um, the article is titled, um, I did psychedelic first aid at a festival in Costa Rica. Um, that's the name of the title. That's what it says on the tin. Um, it's currently available on my medium. You're welcome to put in the show notes um, if you'd like. Um, yeah. uh, Fest 300 has since been acquired and the magazine lives on, but it's um, I, you know, at this stage, I feel like I'm happy to just send you to my medium to read work that I've done. Um, but then when I released this article, I kind of pulled the levers of, of 
the community that had been supporting me in doing it. And this was around the time that Michael Pollan's trip treatment article came out. So this is before um, this is before the book, but it was kind of this mo. It was a threshold moment in a lot of ways. And because we were an independent publication, and we were we were getting at our peak, we were about half a million unique views a month. So we we're like a pretty big publication in the festival space. Um, and so for us to come down like really strong in in on the side of harm reduction versus prohibition, we were able to do that in a way that other publications weren't. And this is before even Vice was doing a lot of this kind of content. It was like a, mm-hmm. an interesting moment. So I put out this article about trip sitting and psychedelic peer support at a time where it was really wanted and needed. And a lot of people in you know MAPS and you know, Dance Safe and other places, the festival lawyer, people who'd been sounding this alarm all kind of got behind it and helped it go viral. That also helped me create a lot of connections that later were really valuable for me professionally. So to circle back to your first question about how one gets to do cool shit, <laughs> community is a big part of it. Mm-hmm. When you're in service to community, if you serve, you are served. You know, And if you're, passion, if you're passionate and working hard at your particular kind of art, your particular kind of service, and you do it in a community way, where you're kind of bringing in and co-creating with people and highlighting other people. That was the vehicle in my life that kind of pushed me professionally to where I am now. And it's a way of thinking about professional development that I'd advise people listening to consider. Um, but that's basically how festival culture got into psychedelics for me. And then, you know, I was doing a lot of my personal psychedelic work while doing psychedelic peer support um, and these connections that I made uh, back with Zendo, many of those people ended up being in prominent positions in maps and elsewhere. Um, and uh, and my network within the festival world, it was kind of a psychedelic network to begin with. So we all kind of grew together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot of crossover in this world. Actually, um, you know, I did Zendo training at Burning Man. Uh, I don't even remember which year that was. 15 or 17? One of the two years. Um and it's just, it's fascinating to see, you know, the, the reputation. I actually avoided Burning Man for, for many years because I thought it was just a bunch of hippies on drugs, even though I was always working with psychedelics, but I just kind of thought, oh, that's not my scene. That's not my scene. And when I went, I had some of the most profound healing and spiritual experiences I've ever had to this day. And I'm someone who's been to the jungle and drank ayahuasca God knows how many times and done the very deep ceremonial work with different plant medicines and these festivals and even the whole, uh, quote, recreational path brings a lot of people to this deeper path of healing with these medicines and actually doing the deeper inquiry work. Like, you know, here you are teaching and speaking about men's work. Um, You know, in our pre-conversation, you mentioned attachment theory. And it's like, okay, yes, there's a group of us. And I think this is a lot of people that start on the path of like, let's just have fun. Let's just party. And eventually it comes to this other place of like, okay, how do we explore this for our own personal growth and for the healing of ourselves, which then, you know, community and the planet. Um, So let's talk about what brought you to Iboga. I was actually, it was interesting. I've been following you a long time and I only think I found out about this maybe a year and a half ago or so. And I was like, whoa, he's gone to Gabon to do Iboga. Like what's up with that? Um, because I only know a few people who've done that, and there are actually my friends who serve Iboga. Um, and it's it's a big step to me, you know. So can we hear a little bit about what brought you to work with Iboga? And I'm curious, what has changed in your life or your career since working with someone something as powerful as Iboga in Gabon? Yeah. So first of all, I did not do Iboga prior to Gabon. So I, um, which apparently was, people thought that was pretty funny. (laughs) That's crazy. (laughs) I, I, I grew up with my mother reading me like the Odyssey and similar sorts of things when I was very little. And I've been very attached to like the hero's journey throughout my life. So, um, I'm actually less this way now. I've, I've kind of mellowed out a little bit, but particularly when I was younger, I, I needed to be on like quests. And I think that's part of why I see festivals as these sort of transformational incubators, because they're also kind of hero's journeys in a way. They can be. And you can, you know, you enter into a container and a festival can be like a liminal space of transformation. And you can enter into it. You experience everything fully. You might get stuck on a certain thing. You might loop on a certain problem that you have. And there's some kind of cathartic moment 
Um, I tend to see life that way and see things that way. Um, after Fest 300 was sold, I had some time and money and presence to experience some things. And um, I started with a Vipassana, which is the 10 days of silent meditation in the Goenka style. That was like how I kicked it off. Um, and I was doing a couple of different things at that time. I did a speaking tour about masculinity in Australia and Southeast Asia. At that time, I did a yin yoga teacher training in Bali. I was, you know, I, I got to do a lot of these different sorts of containers. And there was something, my the idea of going to Africa to do Iboga was kind of lingering in my mind as this sort of like epic, you know, this epic journey, this epic quest to do. And like any great quest, it was fueled by a kind of fatal flaw, fatal flaw, maybe not fatal. It was, I, my quest was fueled by a, by a fundamental disease within me, which has been my relationship to sex and sexuality. Um, I, my sexuality was felt very kind of repressed when I was younger. I had a lot of shame and a lot of fear around um, my sexuality and what it meant. I'm, a, I'm bisexual and kinky and strange. I just have a very psychedelic sexuality. Um, and when I was an adolescent, I couldn't fit that into the world. And so what I did is I kind of like separated what I thought was acceptable sexually into what was a, allowed to happen in the world, which was heterosexual romantic comedy. And then what was allowed to happen in my mind or in my relationship to my computer, which was all the sort of kinky, queer, strange things that I liked. What I did in so doing was I developed a digital sex addiction, which is endemic in this moment. There's so many, especially men, because of the way our brains are wired evolutionarily. But it's, it's, there's so many people who have this problem. But what happens is when you get addicted to digital sex, whether that's pornography or even if it's, you know, in my case, a lot of like erotic fiction um, was a big part of it. Um, you train your brain and even your body to have sex in a solo computer way. Um, and that can lead to erectile dysfunction and delayed ejaculation and these different issues. And I basically, because of my relationship to digital sex and because of my sort of fear and shame around my sexuality, I couldn't really connect sexually and I couldn't orgasm um, with another person. And so for me, I went to Gab Gabon. So Iboga is, is kind of understood as a master pattern breaker, um, particularly around addiction. Um, it, it interacts with opioid receptors. So that's part of why it's been a particularly efficacious tool for heroin addiction. But it's not just that. It's, it, it, um, it's such a colossal experience both the archer of the experience itself and the the way in which it sort of resets your neurochemistry that it's it's thought of as this extraordinary tool for addiction and i felt that it was the tool that i could use to kind of break this digital sex addiction which would allow me to have a fully surrendered present sexual experience which would allow me to create a long-term sustainable relationship and have a family, which is something that I have always wanted and really want. I really want to be a dad. I really want to be a great dad. It's very important to me. Um, so that's why I went to Gabon because I wanted to like slay the dragon that was my own digital sex addiction through the sort of like Mount Kilimanjaro of psychedelics, which is a book Wow. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for sharing this very vulnerably. And I appreciate your authenticity around this because I know there are so many people listening who can relate because we all know this is happening left and right, whether it's this addiction or another. It's, you know, these medicines can really help us break these patterns um, that run very deep. And of course, you know, we could probably do a whole podcast on what is the cause of these. But, you know, there's deep level trauma whether it's family, society, all of the above. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Now, I'm curious, uh, you know, you have become a host of the Psychedelic Therapy Podcast. You've worked with Iboga. Um, pretty much, I think, all the medicines, can I assume? If you've done Iboga, you've probably worked with everything out there, right? I've, Am I I've, right? I've, I've done all the major, I've had all the major experiences aside from a traditional peyote experience. And mm -hmm. I actually have 
I have an opinion about peyote. I feel like we shouldn't do peyote actually. Yeah. Um, I feel like the, 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 well, the conservation issues around it are, are a big deal. So I, and I think you can, I personally feel like you can get to the same place with San Pedro. Um, and so I would say that I've done, and I mean, sustainability is an issue with all of these medicines. I've done, I've done the full spread, um, but I haven't done a traditional peyote ceremony for, you know, conservation reason. And also I haven't been invited. I feel like it's the type of thing that one ought to be invited to do. And it ought to be, make sense in the context of the wisdom keepers of that medicine. And San Pedro is different because it can grow anywhere and you can just, you know, you can grow it yourself and eat it. Um, but anyway, yeah, suffice it to say, I've done many of the medicines. So, so then, you know, as a host of the psychedelic therapy podcast, can you tell us, um, you know, what do you see as this, this kind of um, intersection that's happening? You know, there's this huge movement in decriminalization, legalization, um, the Michael Pollan book, the new Michael Pollan book, you know, just the growing interest in working with psychedelics and also this growing need, like meaning the demand is really high. Um, there are so many people out there who have done all the things and they don't know where to turn. And they are hearing about all of this on the mainstream media or even on the podcast about, okay, psychedelic healing, this can really help you. This can reset your brain. This can, you know, cure addictions. Um, I'm curious, you know, to go on your, your journey from, you know, festival life to something as profound as Gabon with Iboga. Um, how, how does this show up? You know, how does your experience show up now that you're also hosting the psychedelic therapy podcast? Like, what are you seeing as the direction for the future of psychedelics? I'm curious if you have any opinion on this. Yeah. So hosting the Psychedelic Therapy Podcast is an extraordinary privilege and honor for me um, because I really do get to talk to everybody. Pretty much everyone will in the psychedelic community will talk to me. I haven't asked Tim Ferriss um, and um, I asked Michael Pollan and I got a sort of like not right now, but yes answer. So, but I've talked to Robin Carhart Harris. I've talked to, you know, I've, I've, talk, I've kind of across the board um, and um so I get, and I get to the, um, what is the word for it? The, it's like constitution, but that's not the right word. The, the, for the psychedelic therapy podcast, my job is to serve psychedelic therapists. So, um, David Champion is the founder of Maya and a good friend of mine. We went to Africa Burn together in 2017 when Maya was just a glimmer in his eye. Um, and I've been, informally supporting and advising from the beginning. And um, I came on board to help create a community strategy around um, Maya's offering of supporting the, the client journey, supporting therapists in, their, in, in supporting the client journey through a technology software solution. Um, and I was kind of brought on to help build the community around that. And I was doing the Life as a Festival podcast at that time and looking at how extraordinary it was for network building. And um, and I suggested, well, we should do a podcast. I'd be happy to host it and set it up. And um, and in this way, we can kind of do something similar to what I did with Fest 300 and with the psych with Life as a Festival is kind of network these this extraordinary community together while simultaneously creating content that's specifically valuable for psychedelic therapists. Um, and so that's the goal of the show. And then with that goal, I just can do whatever I want, basically. So I can talk to whoever I want. I can ask them whatever I want. Um, just before this call, I actually was doing a podcast um, with uh, Dr. Priya Parmer, um, who is um, a psychiatrist who is onboarded ketamine into her, her work about four years ago. Um, and in that conversation, we got to talk a lot about what it's like for her as a psychiatrist for over 20 years to bring ketamine into her work. And that's really interesting to me because I, you know, as I mentioned, I was, I was a troubled teen. I did that whole thing. I was on antidepressants in my early twenties. Um, and so I get to ask what matters most to me. And as I have more conversations and I learn more and I mature and I'm tracking the space and seeing how the space is maturing, what I get to talk about gets to be more and more kind of cutting edge. Um, and so 
Remind me of, wait, remind me of your exact question. I want to make sure I'm actually answering it. <laughs> yeah, psychedelic medicine in this, because you're dealing with now psychedelic therapists. And I'm curious about this kind of convergence of there's the recreational path, there's like the ceremonial path, and then there's this, you know, like legal therapy path. And I'm curious if you have noticed a shift or patterns or where things are changing in the future or going towards. Yeah, so it's interesting it's a very interesting time, of course. Things are moving very, very fast. And there's a lot of startups in the space. There's a lot of squabbling. There's a lot of people who are sort of like cross with each other. Um, there's a lot of like who is authentic and who is not and who deserves to be and what is included and what isn't. And and does this board have enough, you know, people of color on it? Or does this, are they honoring the indigenous traditions enough? So there's a lot of that conversation. I think all of that is welcome and healthy. Um, and I think it's good that we're we're having those. And I think the psychedelic community writ large is, um, you know, funky and uh, and a bit much at times. But ultimately, it's a lot of bright people with their hearts in the right place who are kind of trying to pull this uh, this renaissance in a direction that's going to be the most um, healing. And the thing is, is like when we talk about psychedelic healing, the foundational healing that really is necessary is a healing of society and culture. When we talk about like mental health issues, um, a lot of this stuff is coming from, you know, it's, it is coming from our biology to my understanding. It is coming from hereditary polymorphisms and, and, and genetic vulnerabilities for sure. But a lot of the experience of mental health issues have to do with how we exist in society, how, um, how connected people are. Um, like Jonah Har Hari's book, mm -hmm. um, Lost Connections, is a good exploration of that. I don't know if you've, if you've read this book. Um, so what I see is psychedelic medicine can go a couple of different directions. Um, and I think there's many of us want it to go in the direction of actually changing business as usual. So there's organizations like Journey Colab is a great organization. They're taking mescaline through the FDA process for treatment of alcoholism. They've also created an indigenous reciprocity trust, and they're foundationally trying to come from an ethical position. Um, Maya Health, we've done something similar. I was part of working on our ethics policies um, as we're starting. So um, the ethical piece of like building an ethical psychedelic company is really important. And one way that this could all go is that not only are we healing individuals who have PTSD or a major depressive disorder or whatever, but we're actually changing society and making society more psychedelic. And by psychedelic, I mean more um, open, more open-hearted, more diverse, more accepting of diversity, uh, just ultimately more free, which I feel like is what I experienced attending Burning Man and what I think is the promise of a, a more psychedelic world. And there's the environment as well. So like psychedelics connect us with nature. The more people who feel connected with nature, the better stewards we will be of an environment that we're, you know, we're at a, obviously a crisis point. So that's one vision. Another vision is that psychedelics somehow get rolled into business as usual. Um, and that we're not seeing major societal change and that um, psychedelic medicine functions similarly to antidepressants in that they become a tool to make people more comfortable in an uncomfortable world where, you know, and there's this um, cautionary tale called We Will Call It Paula, which many in the psychedelic community have read. Um, I'd suggest reading it if you haven't, but it was a product of um, the group behind the North Star Psychedelic Pledge. But basically, you know, if you go back to industrial capitalism, everything was built around replicating labor. So, you know, the education system that came out of that world was a, was essentially an assembly line education system to get people to work in factories. To, and the way that we approach medicine and healing is similar, like keep the capitalist wheel turning. Psychedelics have a chance to um, support the transition of that. In the same way that psychedelics have a chance to support the healing of humans, psychedelics don't heal humans. They support humans healing themselves. Psychedelics are not by their very nature going to change the way we work in society, but they will awaken people and, and, and you know, people with certain agency to make change. And that is w the way that I hope that things will go. 
And there's some signs that things are kind of lumbering somewhat in that direction. There's signs that they're sort of lumbering in the other direction. I think venture backed psychedelic startups are tricky. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, it's an interesting time. And I feel like with the psychedelic therapy podcast, part of my job is to, it's specifically for psychedelic therapists themselves. So we talk about things like indigenous reciprocity and that sort of thing, but we're also talking about, you know, ketamine protocols and how, um, you know, a new, uh, research laboratory at UCSF is, uh, is researching set and setting and what that might mean for a psychedelic practitioner. So it's, you know, it's across the board, but I feel really blessed because I then get to have these amazing conversations, ask whatever questions I want. It builds up my knowledge that then I bring into the next conversation I have. So I'm not a psychedelic therapist or practitioner myself by any means, but I'm just professionally curious. And I like to think good at asking questions and listening to people. Um, so yeah. So I, as far as like projecting what the future of psychedelic medicine could look like, I mean, the cat is out of the bag for sure. Um, so we, uh, we really need to build models for the ethical injection of psychedelics into society so that they don't get co-opted by, you know, big pharma or, um, you know, military intelligence or, you know, creepy things. Uh, Jamie Wheel um, talks a lot about this stuff. So he's a great person to listen to around his his concerns about psychedelic medicine. For me, my final piece, again, I'm talking too fast. Um, I think that the best container for psychedelic healing actually is a festival um, or something like a festival, um, something where there's celebration, community, participation, and psychedelic medicine with the right structures to manage healing. So I'm not saying like take a bunch of mm -hmm. like um, Iraq war veterans, pump them full of MDMA and put them at Coachella and that's going to cause healing. I'm not saying that by any means, but the technology of a transformational festival, the different components to it, the, com the, the temporary incubator of communal living, um, and uh, these kinds of workshops, embodiment experiences, and celebration and dance with the, like this technology feels like it runs beautifully parallel with psychedelic healing itself. And I'd love to see models that aren't just, you know, certainly not just a doctor's office or even like a cohort based retreat center, but actually have uh, a kind of decentralized leadership communal celebration participation experience similar to a burn but with the goal being specifically healing and flourishing um and so because i believe that that is the most potent container i'm my my eye is on people building things like that i'm very interested in that and concurrently i want to tell the story that we should enter those containers for the sake of healing and when i'm in those containers like i was this past weekend i was in a, an, a situation like this i have a lot of conversations with people to like support that um i am uh, on more than one occasion the weird k shaman who's like who's like helping facilitate my work in psychedelic peer support is, is that too supporting, like if someone's having a psychedelic experience difficult or no, um, can you be present for their human flourishing mm -hmm. and then for their integration as they leave that container? So that's the future as I see it. And kind of like the, the merging of the worlds that matter most to me. Beautiful. This is a beautiful vision. And I, I do love that you pointed out all these different scenarios of the way that the direction this could go in. And the one thing I find interesting is, yes, there's definitely a lot of concern, including me, including a lot of my clients about, you know, the, the VCs and getting their hands on everything and patenting and, you know, coming up with new, you know, new strains that are just theirs. But the reality is I have yet to work with a psychedelic that just puts the bandaid on things like Prozac does. Um, you know, for the most part, the way psychedelics work is that they bring a lot of your shit to the surface that's actually very uncomfortable. It's not always the unicorns and rainbows. I'm sure your Iboga was not at all unicorns and rainbows. There were no unicorns and, or rainbows. Were, I know. There yeah. you go. So, 
I mean, but this is the reality and this is why I agree with you on some level. It, it's not just about the psychedelic as, you know, this is the early 90s with, you know, um, antidepressants. It is about, you know, learning the embodiment, doing the integration, understanding the somatics, understanding what's happening through the process and having the, the peer support or therapist support or coach support or whatever kind of support it is to help you process through it to then get like the profound healing experience. So this, I'm glad you just said what you said about this vision of bringing it all together, right? Like in a transformational space, maybe it's a, a future of psychedelic healing centers where there are, you know, where they integrate sound healing and dance and breath work and psychedelics and somatic therapy and all at once. This actually is what Rick Doblin said a few years ago when I interviewed him. And this is like, to me, that's where the real healing is at. But so when, you know, and the psychedelic therapy podcast and, you know, I've interviewed a few therapists myself as well. The one question I have is, what about all the people who are holding space for the healing with psychedelics that are not actual licensed therapists? For example, we all know there are many, you know, amazing facilitators out there. There are coaches, there are people who've done a lot of their own interpersonal, you know, growth development work, and they know how to hold the space. They've maybe done Zendo training or integration coaching training. What, where do they fit into all of this? And I'm curious, you know, coming from Maya Health, which I do understand how Maya Health platform is actually meant only to serve therapy, you know, therapeutic model. But where do where does like the non-licensed, you know, space holder fit into this larger picture of psychedelic therapy? Well, the first thing I'll say about that is that I don't think that there is a healing experience where you you do you heal and then you're done and you're healed and you kind of go back to the world as an un, as a healed person. The process that I see and I actually talk about in Life as a Festival a fair amount is this celebrate heal serve kind of like trajectory where they're all sort of happening together but you're sort of flowing through them. So you arrive at a festival with a desire to celebrate and that celebration, particularly with the support of psychedelics, um, shows you what needs to be healed because you're like, I feel so amazing here, but then I feel bad here and I feel so great in this community, but then I go back to my life and I don't feel very good. So that leads us to healing. But healing takes us a certain point, takes us to a certain point where then service kind of steps in as well. I've spoken to a number of um, you know ayahuasca facilitators who have done this for a long time and they've all shared with me a similar pattern where you, first your pro, first first time you do ayahuasca first couple of times you get to have the oneness of all things experience it's very philosophical you get you get like the download where you're like oh this is great then you go through a process of personal healing and kind of cleansing where it's like pretty hard and you you're moving a lot through your system and i've i've been at that place for a while um, and then there's that sort of transforms to a stage where you're kind of moving other people's shit through your system. And you're actually like, as a vessel, you're pretty clean, but you're moving through other people's shit. And that's, there's a kind of apprenticeship model in ayahuasca circles that's similar to that, where you, you know, at a certain point, you're asked if you want to be a guardian, if you want to be, you know, if you want to hold space in a certain way, or even if you just want to like work in the kitchen. So there is this process of the kind of the wounded healer archetype where you go from receiving to serving. And it happens in many different modalities. So for the gray, for the quote gray market of uh, a psychedelics, I think that's a big part of what's been happening is people who have experienced this and then are stepping into it. Um, your question is um, what about those people? How do they fit into this? transition yeah like you know especially coming from the psychedelic therapy podcast um you know i know that's made for therapists but let's be honest here there's even there's not a huge supply of actual licensed psychedelic therapists out there in the grand scheme of things not for the amount of demand that uh, from the people seeking the help that can actually access them and afford them the, the people i know who are psychedelic therapists literally cannot take on more clients um, and so that that has now opened up like, OK, there are a lot of people doing facilitation or one on one sessions or people who've studied this, like done done the work, not not just saying like someone goes and takes psilocybin and the next day wants to facilitate. But the people who have been on this path and now they are called to service. But where does where does that fit into this larger model of 
psychedelic therapy or, or does it, or is this just always going to be a separate thing? Um, you yeah, know, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. So, so there's different sort of paths to being a psychedelic healer in certain ways. Like for example, to become a, a ayahuasca shaman in any real sense, you need to really go to the jungle and train with a lineage for a significant amount of time. What that does is that creates um, a kind of safety and security for the most part, um, where people, you know that people have been trained and they've sat in many different ceremonies and they've seen a lot. One of the issues that you have, I think, with the gray market and an unregulated market is just as you've said, people can call themselves a shaman or call themselves a healer. And there is a lot of opportunity for, um, for misconduct, um, for abuse to happen in those environments. And I think we do need a, regula a regulated body of psychedelic practitioners. And we're at a place right now where we're starting to have, and we had it back in you know the 50s and 60s to a certain extent, but we're starting to have the research that's really informing what does it actually mean to play a certain kind of music during a psychedelic experience? How do you gauge whether someone's experience is, is exactly the right kind of stress that's helping growth, or if they may be being re-traumatized? I think there's a Pollyanna perspective of psychedelics that they're always good and that the medicines are just going to carry the day. But if you if you even look at your own personal experience and people in your network, there's lots of people who've been traumatized by psychedelic experience. Oh there's God. a lot of there's a lot of gray market practitioners who don't know what the fuck they're doing. Even people who've done it for a while, and there's a very pernicious issue of um, psychedelic spiritual ego that comes in to the point of like a spiritual narcissism and even a kind of delusion, you know, and we spoke before we started talking about my commitment to skepticism. I, you know, I know of people, I've met people who believe that they are channeling some sort of like deity in the context of healing someone else. And I just think it's a, I think that's bullshit. I just don't think it's real. I personally don't think it's real. Even my and, shaman doesn't think that's real, by the way. And, and, <laughs> and he's been doing it for 30 years. <laughs> and, and, and more than that, like, if you look at the ego that can come into place in that, it's really problematic. So we need, we need regulation, we need humility, we need, and, and a lot of like self-proclaimed shamans, um, don't have that. Now, people who've studied with deep lineages for a long period of time and really learned, um, I trust those folks and they're not regulated by any sort of like Western medical establishment, but I trust them and I've sat with them and I, I, I'm discerning. But as you've said, you know, we have way more need for psychedelic therapy than people who can practice. And I'm really worried about people being taken advantage of and people are like, okay, so this mushroom ceremony is going to heal my, you know, sexual trauma. And then they step into a place that isn't trauma informed with someone who has, you know, really likes psychedelics and believes that when they're under the influence of psychedelic, believes that they're being guided and such all their instincts are right, when they may not have any clue what they're doing and they may end up causing a lot more harm than good. So where do the gray market practitioners fit? Well, there are definitely gray market practitioners who are amazing and heroic and have been doing something illegal in service of healing and they deserve praise for that but there's also a bunch of fucking narcissists in there too and like it's a tricky place so i actually would love to see more um more regulation in terms of like how people are doing this and more so there's you know like with 5meo dmt there's a group called the conclave that's kind of like an internal regulating body mm -hmm. that um you know is, is is trying to make sure that people are following certain best practices with that extremely potent medicine so there's some things like that but we need more of it and yeah. um jamie wheel talks a lot about how you know in traditional um ecstatic uh m m technologies like illusion mysteries or what are these sort of like these uh, technologies of ecstasis, that there were so many barriers to um, to achieving them. So like right now you can, and like a, a 10 year old can smoke 5-MeO-DMT if they get their hands on it. Like you just take a pipe and you light it and you breathe it in. So it's like someone can just do it. Whereas, you know, in more traditional lineages, you have to kind of earn it and build up the ability to do it. And that kind of cre keeps you safe. So we're in this weird in-between period where we need to up upgrade how we're approaching it. 
um, or we're, or we're potentially causing a lot more harm than good. Yeah. And you brought up some really valid points that have been on the forefront in this industry very recently, because the reality is as well, even, even licensed therapists who've been doing it for 20, 30 years, there's some ego narcissism in there as well. I mean, let's be honest, we're all human, right? And so to me, it's a larger discussion of like, okay, who is writing this? I actually know about the conclave and what they've put together. And then the, there's also the North Star um, agreement or I don't know, I forgot the, what the official term is. Pledge, the pledge, yeah. And these are people who are getting together, having some guidelines, at least laying it down. And also, I think it's important to have these discussions about education and being discerning and really doing your research on who you decide to sit with and work with and um, and to also have that trauma informed, um, you know, background, like not to a bit again, you know, who am I to say this? Someone might just take mushrooms and decide they want to start serving them, you know, and that's the reality of the world we live in. There's a lot of ego. There's a lot of narcissism. There's a lot of people who haven't done their own healing work. And, you know, this is the reality. And, but I think, you know, having these discussions and I'm sure, you know, with, with the work you're doing with Maya Health and the therapists, this is going to be a bigger discussion every day. Um, it's come up so much recently with some recent allegations from a very well-known psychedelic therapist who was very trusted in this community. So, you know, it's interesting. And I think there's a we could do a whole different episode on this. I would love to get into it more. But, um, but you know, we only have a few more minutes. So I want to ask you some last questions and give you an opportunity to share you know, what's coming up with you? Um, tell us a little bit more about, you know, what you have in the works, where people can find you and the direction you want to be going in with your psychedelic entrepreneurship in the next year or so. I'm curious. Well, for one thing, I am enjoying posting more memes on Instagram lately. So that's an important <laughs> change my life. I sort of joke, but I'm actually really enjoying like finding memes that I, that I let, that say what I want to say about the world. So um, like I posted something this weekend that said, remember, if you don't sin, then Jesus died for nothing. Um, I saw that. <laughs> and I just, so I, so that's something I'm, I'm joking, but that's something that's new and fun for me. Um, my Instagram <laughs> is probably the best place to connect with me as a human in the world. Um, and it's just my full name at Eamon Armstrong. Um, I have a website that's eamonarmstrong.com. Um, my podcast is life is a festival. I also do the psychedelic therapy podcast. And the big thing that I'm doing right now, um, is, uh, pitching a television show based on life is a festival, which is just another step in my mission, which is promoting community healing through festival culture and through psychedelic culture. And I deeply believe in it. I, and I believe that it needs stu wise stewards. Um, I brought up Jamie wheel a lot on the podcast. Um, I also try to promote a certain kind of skepticism and a certain kind of like good mental hygiene in the context of these experiences. So I hope by creating a television show that's for a mainstream audience, in this moment of psychedelic renaissance, that that can be a teaching platform to uh, help people understand how to enter these experiences, to get the most out of them in terms of their own blossoming and self-expression while avoiding some of the pitfalls of, as I've said, sort of like spiritual ego um, and some of the other challenges that can occur if you don't have sort of the right attitude going into this work. So. Yeah, so working on pitching the show. I'm also um, at this point wanting to connect with some more psychedelic uh, organizations. Um, I've been kind of positioned as a as a psychedelic culture specialist, um, and so I'm I, I, I'm as I'm looking at my time and how I'm using it, I want to onboard um, a couple more like advisory positions um, and have more influence in the psychedelic space by aligning myself with people who I think are really really doing it well. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, and I'm single and, uh, I am happy single, which I was in the process of letting go of a partnership for a while. So I was unhappy single. So now I'm happy single, which is very fun. I haven't been happy and single in a while. So that's new on my horizon. Um, and I am intending to get back into doing some of the men's work. We didn't touch on that. 
much. I was going to um, ask about that, actually. I want to know what you're doing with the men's work, retreats or groups. Yeah, so I, I, are, are you familiar with the Dunner, Dunning-Kruger curve? Dunning-Kruger? No. Um, it's, it's a U-shaped curve where it's like the more you, the less you know, the more you think you know at the top of the curve. And then as you know more, you realize you don't know anything and you go down to the bottom. And then over time you start to know. So I was very, I was giving uh, workshops on uh, mature masculinity a lot around 2014, 15, 16. Um, And I was offering something I think of value looking through, looking at the mythopoetic men's movement. Um, But I felt like I, I kind of, as I was doing those talks, I became aware of how much more I had to learn. Um, And so I actually took a break from doing public speaking altogether. And I just focused on podcasting and asking questions instead of claiming any sort of knowledge. Um, But now I'm interested in in bringing back some of the men's work. I was recently at the Sacred Sons retreat um, and had Adam Jackson, one of the founders on my podcast. Um, So it's, so mature masculinity, healthy sexuality, these are things that are very important to me and they kind of sit alongside the sort of like community festival, psychedelic gender sexuality space. So I want to continue working in that as well. We'll see how that looks. Things are opening up with COVID. I I think I'm going to start speaking at festivals again or doing live podcasts. Um, So I think 2022 might be a really vibrant time for me professionally and for the, um, for the communities and sort of industries that I, that I'm working with. So um, I'm feeling very grateful at the moment. Awesome. No, and that's, thank you so much for sharing that because I, I actually just had a Mikeadelic on talking about men's oh, work in the psychedelic yeah. space. Yeah, yeah. And I know the Sacred Sons and the work they're doing. And I just actually went to an event all about the sacred masculine, sacred feminine, the sacred union, and this work. We could, well, I'll have to bring you back to do a whole nother episode on this because I think this work is so important, especially for men right now during this time. So, Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate the work you're doing in all these realms. And yes, there's so many more opportunities for you to have influence so we can really create a transformed society. So thank you, Eamon, for being here. I really appreciate it. Well, it's been such an honor, Beth. I really appreciate being invited on the show and all of your questions. And um, yeah, thank you for having me. And thanks to everyone who took the time to listen. Awesome. So I'll have all your links that you mentioned right here in the show notes. Please follow him on Instagram. The memes are pretty good so far. So. I mean, I just started with the memes. I feel oh like, gosh. you know, I didn't really think of memes <laughs> as like a tool for sharing information they're in so the way good. that they are now. But they're they're great. And they, and they, they are travel. great. <laughs> they travel. And it's not like putting up the meme for the likes. It's like, how's, here's a funny way that I can say something that's really important to me. So... <laughs> It's I good to laugh that, at ourselves. I, yeah, i.e. that we should be sinning, for example, which I <laughs> absolutely think that we should be kind sinners. <laughs> awesome. Amen. It was so fun having you here. Thank you so much. And be sure to join us next Tuesday for another episode of Psychedelic Entrepreneur.